Thank you very much, everybody, for joining this session on US-China relations and the future of the rules-based international system. My name is Shamila Nebrajani. I'm Chief Executive of Wilton Park, and I'm delighted to be able to moderate this panel. Wilton Park, as many of you will know, is the International Forum for Dialogue and an executive agency of the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We've been convening dialogues with senior representatives from the worlds of policy, diplomacy, academia, business, civil society, the military and the media for over seven de decades. We may have some Wilton Park regulars in the room. Uh, if you are, you know that typically we convene our dialogues over two and a half days. Uh, today we have about 45 minutes to make progress on this topic. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a dialogue that is both focused uh, and challenging and some great questions also from the audience. We're very pleased to have worked with the Doha Forum to organize this panel discussion. The US-China bilateral relationship is undoubtedly the most important one in the world today. There has been much discussion in recent years of whether the two countries will fall into the Thucydides trap, which postulates that a long-standing great power and a rising one threatening to displace the former will almost inevitably fight a war. The only war to date has been of the trade variety, but that could come to have massive consequences for both countries and indeed for the rest of the world. Will the relationship become one of zero-sum conflict? Can the parties find a way to maintain <coughs> some balance of competition and cooperation? And critically for our discussion today, how will the evolving US-China bilateral relationship affect the future of the rules-based international system? In today's panel, we will try to draw out three key themes. Theme one, what is the likely equilibrium point in the US-China relationship in coming years? What are the risks of decoupling on the rest of the world, looking at key global agendas such as climate, technology, and trade? Theme two, what should small and medium-sized states do in the face of this changing world order? How can vital regional blocs, such as the European Union, which has a huge stake in the survival of the robust rules-based order, or ASEAN, such a significant regional bloc affected by the US-China relationship, how can these blocs achieve sufficient influence singly and together to help revise and strengthen international rules and help establish an equilibrium point in a way that is good for all. And finally, theme three, how is great power rivalry, including actually with Russia, and the current state of flux and strain on multilateralism, affecting stability and prosperity in regions such as Africa and the Middle East? I'm very pleased to have a distinguished panel of experts here with me to introduce these issues. We have, firstly, uh, Jim Loy. Jim is partner and chief operating officer of the Asia Group. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mabel Miao Lu, co-founder and secretary general of the Center for China and Globalization. Professor Danny Kua, the dean and Li Kaoxing professor of economics at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. Professor Stephen Chan, professor of world politics and previously the dean at SOAS in the University of London. And Emma Sky, director of the Yale World Fellows Program from Yale University. Let me start with you, Jim, if I could. There's been widespread hardening of American views towards China in recent years, but there remains substantial debate over US objectives and the strategy for a bilateral relationship. What do you think a new equilibrium point in the US-China relationship might look like from an American perspective? How might China policy in the administration evolve if President Trump, uh, Trump is reflected as re-elected? Forgive me forgive me, is re-elected? And how far could technology decoupling potentially go? Your remarks, please. Thank you. Am I supposed to press a button on this? Or? I think you can just speak. OK. Uh, well, thank you, Sharmila, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, as I ref re reflect on that, I think it's, it is the case that there really is, there really has never been balance in the US-China relationship. I mean, if you look back a set, uh, a, 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 across the last century of US-China relations, you see these periods of, of pro-engagement sentiment, largely motivated by typically American idealism about what that, that engagement can yield, followed by periods of, of 
you know, bitterness and no engagement when those, uh, those hopes and dreams are not realized. Uh, obviously, you had in the, the, the 20s and 30s up through World War II, uh, both the, the sense that the, uh, the nationalist government presented a new uh, future for China. You had World War II and the fight against the Japanese, followed by, obviously, uh, a couple of decades uh, after the ascendancy of the Communist Party. And, and then once again, with, with Nixon, the hopes of uh, pulling China away from Russia um, and pro-engagement to be crushed by 1989. Um, followed next by the sense that if we folded China into the global economy through the WTO, that we could somehow make China like us. And I think where we are now is on the bitterness side, of re realizing that that, that, was not, uh, that has not been the case. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people see the, the current state of U.S.-China relations and they, they, uh, they associate it with, with Trump. But I think you have to recognize that U.S.-China policy right now is probably one of the few areas where there's actually bipartisan consensus. Uh, President Trump obviously has his own choice of tactics, but I think strategically he does speak for uh, a, a pretty wide swath of the political spectrum. And so uh, even, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we had, a, a, we, we hit pause yesterday on the trade mm -hmm. war, um, my belief is it's just a pause. Uh, there are any number of ways for this to go sideways. It still is pretty much a, a, work, uh, a work in progress. Um, you know, they haven't agreed where to sign it. The text hasn't been translated into Chinese. Uh, the last time we were at this phase, when it was translated into Chinese, is when a lot of the commitments were allegedly pulled back. Um, so uh, I think we can expect that, uh, you know, whether it's after a period where implementation is not what the administration hoped it would be, uh, or for other reasons, um, we will continue on a, tra a trajectory of, of tough economic and trade relations with China. And I think you have to look at, at a host of other underlying geopolitical issues that could also accelerate that, um, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Taiwan arms sales, uh, whether it's Xinjiang, um, South China Sea. Uh, there are any number of um, hotspots which could really, um, you know, kind of pit the two sides against each other. And what you have, I think, in Washington right now is the, the current swing of the pendulum back towards a, um, you know, kind of anti-engagement is you've got uh, an empowered set of, of you know, what, what we refer to as hawks uh, who are, you know, proposing any number of policies, whether it's on investment, whether it's on the ability of Chinese firms to, to list, uh, the ability of Chinese students to study uh, in um, high-tech fields in the U.S., um, and a lot of these things are only starting to percolate. And so I think the pendulum has uh, quite a bit of ways further to swing. And that is going to uh, lead to, I don't think a full-scale decoupling, but certainly selective decoupling as we see right now uh, in, in uh, 5G, but also I think in, in fields like AI, quantum computing, pretty much any of those sectors that are part of the Made in China 2025 plan, um, I think will remain uh, sensitive. And, um, so I, I think, you know, what you're seeing right now are just really the leading edges. Uh, you know, the pendulum will swing back, but if you go by kind of those, those, those periods uh, over, of history that I referred to, uh, we probably still have quite a, bit, quite a bit of ways to go. Can you say, uh, Jim, where you think if the, if the pendulum is to swing back, what are the points of catalyst? Where are the sectors where there is likely to be more opportunity for... Uh, co-opetition or some degree of um, uh, alignment between the two? Well, look, there's going to be competition in, in virtually every sector. And, and, you know, that's not something that we should obviously shy away from. Uh, competition is good. Uh, you know, the arguments that resonate in Washington are that the competition has to be on a level playing field. Uh, and when you look at the trade agreement or the first phase, phase one agreement that was struck yesterday, uh, it really misses the biggest elephants in the room um, on subsidies, on cybersecurity, on non-financial services, uh, market access. And frankly, the things that, that we secured uh, in, in this earliest phase were things that largely could have been obtained uh, a year and a half ago. So the ball has really just been kicked down the road. And I think as long as you have a Chinese economy that uh, continues to move towards uh, you know, being driven by the state sector, uh, that enjoys uh, benefits from the state, uh, where there's the perception and, and in many cases the reality of 
uh, uneven comp uh, competitive uh, playing field, uh, then you're going to continue to to see that being a concern because now these are sectors where, you know, the U.S. Uh, has long felt that it enjoyed a competitive edge, whether it's you know high tech, manufacturing, mm -hmm. aviation, the automotive industry, et cetera. And uh, the, the scale is the scale of the competitive threat is so much different now than it was in any you know previous time in, in the history of our relations. Thank you very much. So uh, Mabel, you've heard that perspective from Jim. Uh, what are the kind of debates taking place in China right now regarding the European, uh, the relationship with the US and how might you describe this equilibrium point that we're searching for between US and China? Thank you, thank you very much for having me and uh, we're glad to return this same stage last year, I remember exactly, I delivered a speech here for uh, the China's uh, International Corporation on BRI. Um, yes, um, one year passed, the world dramatically changed, especially the US and China relations. Um, from my perspective and from uh, the Chinese perspective, we believe the Yesterday's announcement of uh, the phase one principle agreement is a very great news. Um, it uh, boosts the the confidence, the global trade confidence. Uh, it also uh, stabilized the global trade, the global market expectation, and uh, it's good for everyone. Like this morning on the uh, morning's panel, uh, many people mentioned that the biggest concern around the world right now is U.S.-China relation. And uh, the IMF released the report to reduce the expectation of the global GDP because of uh, the changing. So it means that the US-China trade tension is not good for neither any country nor the rest of the world. So um, this is the major ideas of it from China's perspective. Um, but in China, we believe the US-China trade negotiation has a long way to go. Like President Trump mentioned that after the phase one, um, he will start the phase two immediately. Um, but uh, it's uh, very unlikely for the two countries to decouple or de entangle. You mentioned, Jim mentioned many times the de decouple, but we should ask how to decouple. What's the purpose of decoupling? Um, so for, I believe for the two countries are too deeply intertwined to separate. Um, US and China are highly complementary with each other in terms of uh, technology, industry, people to people exchange, higher education, um, and so on, a lot of fields. China has never thought about replacing US, but to maintain and contribute to the world existing global system. Um, I believe China and US have to work together in the future so that the rule-based international system, like we, our topic is that, is able to function well. Um, secondly, I believe the rise of China is a fact. So we have to admit that the international system is developing towards eventually multipolar. Uh, multipolarity is our major topic on this Doha co conference with a great challenges of globalization, we need to establish a multilateral international order to strike balance between the powers and achieve peace and prosperity, especially for the small and medium states. So um, I believe that uh, in, uh, the US and China can be able to coexist. Decoupling or the entangling is not likely to happen because um, as I mentioned, the inter intertwined between us is so deeply. We know that uh, there are more than 17,000 U.S. companies generate more than 900 billion USD in revenue every year. You know that uh, the uh, Ford, uh, Ford uh, GM um, sell more cars in China than in U.S. The um, Boeing sells the flights more in China than any other else world, uh, else place in the world. So um, we know that the, the Walmart president just came to my office to talk with me that there are more than 20% of the goods they import from China for their supply to their uh, supermarkets. So uh, in China, 
we believe that U.S. China are complementary to each other and have great potential to work together. So it's not possible for us to totally decouple or we could have the, a lot of potential to, de to develop the mutual trust. But to achieve that, we still need to communicate with each other in many levels and increase mutual understanding more. Can you say, uh, Mabel, where you think uh, the next stage, if there is to be a phase 2A, 2B, 2C, as we heard sure. uh, in the previous session, which are the areas of that are the richest in potential for finding a, a good relationship between the US and China? Yeah, uh, in terms of the uh, common interest, I believe, you know, mm, like the technology itself, I know this is a very sensitive topic. Uh, China have in high, China developed the 5G very well. Like the US developed Boeing. This is the common the common value of the world as a common goods. The developed uh, innovation of the human being. How to imagine if uh, uh, US developed the Boeing, innovate Boeing? We don't use that flight. So China developed 5G. China is good at uh, 5G. I think this is a good way we can cooperate. Um, and another field I believe is good field for our um, joint um, interest that common interest that the Build and Road Initiative. We know that oh right now uh, the U.S. is not signing the MOU with China and BRI, but uh, you know um, China is good at the development infrastructure. Uh, when I took the train from Boston to New York, it's a terrible experience for me if I spent a lot, so long without Wi-Fi make me crazy you know <laughs> and uh, you know why why US couldn't cooperate with China on BRI and uh, and of course and uh, BRI is a possibility of our cooperation to explore and uh, I think another issue is WTO reform um, Unfortunately, earlier this week, we know that the paralyzed of WTO, um, yeah, because of the US block the appointment of the last judgment, the judge. So, um, but you know, like the president of Davos this morning mentioned that the trade is not a weapon, but a key to prosperity for human beings. Um, you know, China based WTO based on globalization because of US. I remember 40 years ago when China opening up, kick off opening up and reform. After one month we established the bilateral relationship with the US. So it means it's a kind of opening up for US at the very beginning. But after the, uh, two, 2001 China access WTO, China's GDP grew up more than 10 times. We benefit from it a lot. We would like to cooperate the US to initiate a new version of WTO. But WTO is the, the linch, linchpin and the, the fundamental of the world um, trade. US benefit a lot from trade as well. How could I work without uh, uh, world without the trade organization, trade mechanism? So this is my yeah, that's okay. cool. Thank you very much. We may return to some of those uh, thoughts, BRI, development infrastructure, the WTO. Oh, sorry, in I, I, and the one point. Please. Is, uh, yeah, it's CPTPP. It's very important. Okay. U.S. withdraw from CPTPP after um, new president took the position. But we know CPTPP is a higher standard and the vision of uh, the globalization and the trade. It be, belong to human beings, not belong to U.S. or China. Uh, I remember exactly last uh, we, uh, last month I was in the eco uh, new economy conference organized by Bloomberg in, in Beijing. I attend participate uh, one panel, and the conclusion we had is that TPP is going global. Invi should invite China and US both join it. Okay. Thank you. We may come back to the pro provocation, uh, Danny Kua, um what do you see are the tensions in the system and how should be the response of both small and medium-sized states and some of the regional blocks we've talked about? <clears throat> thank you, Shamila, and thank you for those questions. I mean, it, it comes in different parts. I'm one of the 77% of the world that doesn't live either in the United States or China, but for whom that particular bilateral relationship is, of course, hugely important. So 
when I speak to this, I speak with some trepidation because I'm speaking as an outside observer. Um, what I'd like to do is get to where you've asked me what the rest of us who don't live in the US or China, what we can do. But the first part of your question has to do with how this discussion is going to unfold. And I think for many of us, uppermost in our mind, not least from yesterday's announcement that phase one had been reached in the trade uh, negotiations, is the US-China trade relationship. And that's, there's no question that that's hugely important. Um, you know, the, the US has for long accused China of systemic abusive trade practices that involve forced technology transfer, intellectual property theft, uh, state intervention in selected industries, huge presence of state-owned enterprises. But it strikes me that those are actually relatively easy to fix or at least talk our way around. Uh, I agree with Jim when he said there's a whole range of issues between the US and China, so that even if we took away the Trump, Navarro, Lighthizer objection to these systemic abusive Chinese trade practices. There'll be a whole lot of other complaints. When, what, are, what are those other complaints? One of the interesting things, the bilateral support that Jim refers to, is that American liberals like Elizabeth Warren and others have lined up with Trump on this taking the side against, against China in this particular conflict. And Elizabeth Warren's complaint is very different from Trump's complaint. Elizabeth Warren's complaint has to do with China's disdain for human rights, disrespect for liberal Western values, uh, an oppressive approach that is intrusive on its own people. And those are complaints that are actually much more fundamental and arguably existential and will be harder to work through in a phase one or phase two type relationship. Uh, there's another threat of this complaint that, has, that comes from the U.S. security establishment. At the beginning of 2018, you'll remember James Mattis, when he was still Secretary of Defense, uh, announced to the rest of the world that America was no longer occupied with terrorism, war on terror, as its number one priority, but instead with geostrategic competition, naming China and Russia as among those rivals. And that will be a lot harder to try and work through. And then finally, of course, there's the dispute about technology. Who has control over technology of the future? 5G is part of that equation, but so is quantum computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, standards on all of these issues. And those will take a lot more to try and work through. So from the perspective of an outside observer, we have to be ready for a long haul on this conflict it's not going to be as simple as just getting the U.S. bilateral trade deficit against China to zero. It's going to be much more than that. So until we figure that out, we might say, what should the rest of the world do? Well, I, I do believe that the rest of the world can get ready for this ongoing period of conflict. And it is, in my answer to you, the second part of your question, it is actually an optimistic answer. It is one that says we can keep the rules-based order that's worked so well for so many of us, but in a way that might be different from how it looks now. Okay. So my first point is the middle powers and the small states should do everything they can to preserve multilateralism and the rules-based order. At that point, our collective muscle memory says, how can we do that? if the US and China are still embroiled in this conflict. So my first point is an expanded one that says, let's try and think about multilateralism without American unipolarity. Let's try and think about a multilateral system that does not presume that the curator, the steward, the guardian of that system has to be the United States or indeed any single great power. The point about middle powers and small states coming center stage to try and negotiate the rules-based order is that we rid ourselves of the idea that we should hand over control of a multilateral system, which after all is supposed to be transparent, inclusive, puts everyone on a level playing field. We have to get rid of the idea that it is a great power that has to manage that system. And part of the pickle 
that we're in with the WTO and elsewhere is that while at one and the same time we've said go for a multilateral, transparent, level playing field, rules-based system, we have handed control of this multilateral system to a single great power in the belief that that great power would, as it did 70 years ago, continue to advance the well-being of the entire world. At this point, we should be asking, is doing that a little bit like inviting a big tech monopolist to advance the well-being of all of society. Sure, they have the power to do that, but why would they? If we are suspicious of big tech monopolists, we should be suspicious of great power monopolies. My first point, middle powers, small states should get rid of this idea. Where does that leave us? You see, we've got a paradox here, and this is my concluding point in the answer to your question. The paradox is that while middle powers and small states have historically thought of themselves as price takers in the rules-based order, we're now being invited to do more than just be price takers. We're invited now to say we can actually help form, help shape, help nudge the rules-based order, which means that we have to break away from the, the paradoxical idea that as price takers, we cannot do that. I think we can. What we've seen in Southeast Asia, in Europe, are the beginnings of a formation of regional, multilateral, based organizations like ASEAN, like the European Union, who are willing to step forward and take leadership on the green agenda, take leadership on forming regional trade agreements, take leadership on smaller niche expert comparative advantage areas in specific policy domains, like preservation of the environment, like green agenda. So I think the role, the role for small states, for middle powers is now available, but we need to rid ourselves of the idea that multilateralism, this wonderful system that's been built out of the rules-based order, will continue to be guided by either the United States or any other great power you'd like to name. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Do you think in that context of um, regional blocks that individual countries will have to subjugate their bilateral relations with either of the great powers? We look at what's happening with Germany and China, yeah. for example. I think historically, uh, trade economists and policymakers have shied away from a proliferation of regional or bilateral agreements because that led to a complication, provided if you had instead a universal multilateral system you could draw on. In this instance, we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We can't keep waiting for the best system to come along. We've got to do what we can. And I think in the shape of Regional Comprehensive Economic Par Partnership, RCEP in ASEAN, in the shape of the EU-Singapore uh, Free Trade Agreement, in the shape of the US, Singapore Free Trade Agreement, in the shape of free trade agreements, 25 of which Singapore has written, with 85% of the world's GDP. We've got the ability to continue to expand the economic space for small states, bearing in mind that the first best system, WTO multilateral, is something that we would still want to keep membership of, and we would still want our rules to continue to respect. Singapore has done that. All other states should be able to do that as well. Very good. Thank you very much. That leads on very well, I think, to uh, Stephen Chan. My question for you, Stephen, you know, what is Africa's state in, uh, stake in the U.S.-China relationship and its impact on the rules-based international system? We've heard about Singapore and the role of regional blocs. What is, it, what is the context in which Africa will have to operate as a continent? No, I think that's a very good question. But first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you to, for Qatar for having me. It's a country for which I have a very, very soft spot, and I'm very happy to be back here. Africa is not just a collection of small states. Some of them are very big states, but by and large, vulnerable states. So the question is, can vulnerable states talk back to the international order, and can they play a part in setting the agenda and preserving a rules-based order? I remember in 2005, seven. Uh, I was asked to participate in what they called the trilateral dialogue. Uh, this was just the very beginning of Western awareness of the inroads that Chinese trade was making in Africa. 
and I was seconded to the African delegation. And we negotiated, or tried to negotiate, terms and principles related to trade uh, in all of the three continents. We traveled widely, very high level delegations. The chair of the African delegation was the deputy chairman of the African Union. And all the other delegations were similarly highly placed. But it became very, very clear at a very early stage of those many meetings that both the American side, that was one part of the trilateral dialogue, and the Chinese side, the other part, the Africans were the third, both of them were concerned very, very much with what prospects for advantage that they could secure from their trading relationships with Africa. Nobody was actually thinking about the Africans themselves, but thinking very much of trade advantage in what was clearly going to be a competitive environment to be able to swing the best trade deals with the emerging continent. So I went away and began thinking about some of the specific elements of the vulnerability of African countries who are still trying to develop their, tra their capacities for trade. Hitherto, traditionally, there have been the suppliers of raw materials, unmanufactured, without any beneficiation. Industry has suffered as a result. There's been no real development of industrial production in Africa. Uh, what happens to an Africa that is discouraged from entering into the realm of industrialization? And I was thinking in particular of certain trade agreements that already do exist between the United States and Africa, particularly the AGOA agreement, which gives huge, as it were, tariff-free or tariff-reduced entry into the United States for African goods, a whole range of goods, well over a thousand goods. But this is meant to be something which covers goods made in Africa by African states. But what happens when Chinese goods are manufactured offshore hmm. in Africa? If they start being included in any future China-America trade war, what this does, even though these might be manufacturing concerns largely owned by Chinese interests, it instantly takes out an entire sector of industrial development in Africa. It jeopardizes the possibility of a growth in employment of African citizens in industrial concerns. Basically, you're looking at something which could be very, very damaging. It reminds me of the African proverb that when the elephants fight, it's the grass that gets flattened. <laughs> so what happens if there's the threat of that kind of flattening of the African move towards industrialization? And I'm thinking particularly about jumping a generation in terms of industrial production, going straight to electronic industries, <coughs> bypassing the heavy industry path that most countries have gone through. Uh, like Mabel, I can't live five minutes without Wi-Fi either. But what you've got now in Africa is just the very, very beginning of a capacity, not so much to manufacture, but to assemble handsets. Uh, this is just beginning. There's a couple of countries where they're trying to assemble them themselves, um, in Rwanda and South Africa, for instance. But most of them are trying to assemble what are basically Android phones, uh, using components largely from China. Now, what you have here is a problem. If, for instance, this kind of technology gets subsumed into a China-America trade war, and the knock-on effect is to an emerging African industrial concern, like Wi-Fi, something which is vitally necessary for the future development of the continent. You join up the continent electronically. You can actually join up citizen bodies, join up systems of government, make things plausible in terms of being able to claim to be a working and a functioning government. Uh, but if you can't develop your own materials, if you can't develop your own technology, uh, then what you've got is basically a setback for the entire continent. And this could be a product of an enhanced America-China trade war. And of course, we're all talking about the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative. Taken at its most literal, this means, of course, a, a very extensive joined up communications and transport corridor. It means much more than that, of course, but in the most literal sense, particularly as it's being built across Transcaucasia, a literal transport and communications corridor. 
it's just in the twinkle of an eye right now, twinkling of an eye, but the Chinese have been talking about a One Belt, One Road initiative in its literal form in Africa, going north to south, um, east to west. If they pull this off, suddenly Africa is joined up. Communications work, transport works. If, however, it is joined up, and this will take quite some time, north to south and east to west, the meeting point between north, south, east, west is Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm. And mm. instantly what you have as a byproduct of that is access to the rare metals that power everybody's Wi-Fi, the rare metals that power the whole future of the electric car industry, <coughs> uh, the whole field that enables us to have some kind of dream about a cleaner and more electronically based future for all citizens in the world. If then there's a competition over those rare metals and Africa is forced to trade with one of the two giants rather than the other, where does that leave the free choice in terms of the direction of development in a very, very important sector? So the vulnerability of Africa is not just something which is of historical standing from colonial days, it's a vulnerability which extends into a future in which they're trying to do better. Are we going to be involved in a trade war that makes their efforts to do better, in fact, worse? Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. They're very uh, thought for raking. Uh, my last speaker before I hand over to the audience for some questions. I know this is a rich topic. Emma, uh, we've heard about the vulnerability uh, of Africa, not just from a colonial history, but for a future. What impact does the great power rivalry between these two powers have for stability in the Middle East? Well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. You know, I sit here listening to all this talk about the rules-based international order, and I think it's worth just noting that it is actually the US that did so much to undermine that rules-based order by the way that it interacted in the Middle East, primarily really with the 2003 invasion of Iraq without a UN Security Council resolution. And from that, the global war on terror, which had the US violating human rights, torturing, holding people without due process, extraordinary rendition. And these have had big knock-on effects in the region. I mean, the Iraq war was supposed to set in place a domino effect of spreading democracy across the region but instead it mobilized a group of jihadis who had a vision not of democracy, but of a caliphate. It also changed the balance of power in the region in Iran's favor, and that's triggered off proxy wars. And it left the US reputation damaged and losing its will, if you like, to enforce the rules-based or uphold the rules-based international order. So the perception of the US withdrawal from the region, and it really is a perception, obviously, because the US still has significant amount of troops in the region, but the perception of the US withdrawal from the region has left a power vacuum that is being filled by other players. We see this in Syria, where you've had Russia getting involved, Iran getting involved, non-state actors. We've also seen the failure of Western countries to be able to stop the bloodshed there. There was a failure to get a UN Security Council resolution, and in large part because Russia and China vetoed anything that they felt would be used to change the regime inside Syria. And recently in the Gulf, when there have been Iranian attacks on Saudi Arabia, the shooting down of a US drone, and there's not been any US response to this, I think this has left Gulf countries feeling vulnerable, no longer sure that they can rely on the US for their security, and so they're hedging. And you can see strong relations being developed with China, but also with Russia. Now, I think China and the US have 
some shared interests in the region, which is important to note. Energy stability, security is obviously one of those. Now, for China, it's getting 50% of its energy resources from the Middle East. The US is becoming increasingly energy independent. And they've both got interest in stability in the region and countering terrorism. The US feels it's done so much to create a security architecture, and China is free riding on that. China has a very different way of approaching countries. China looks at having friendships with every country in the region and sees development peace as opposed to Americans' democratic peace as the way to go. And with the Belt and Road Initiative, it sees that it can help stabilize the region with investment, with, um, well, not, not focus on the human rights reforms, but really looking at economic investment to bring prosperity. And it sees prosperity rather than changes in governance as the key to stability in the region. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panel, for those opening remarks. I know there's bound to be some questions from the audience. Already some hands are going up. There are some roving mics. I've got a gentleman here in the red tie and two at the back there. So let's go in turn. Sir, please. Questions to speakers. I am Professor Panarin, Igor Moscow. I doctor political science and I have geopolitical dream. Meeting of the leader superpower state, China, United States and Russia in Belgrade in 2020 uh, to create the new old order, order without arms, arms proxy, war, arms hybrid war and armed conflict. And I think what you see about my idea, future maybe, maybe 2030, Maybe never. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I've got two colleagues at the back. A man there with his hand up. Thank you. The microphone is just right by you. Thank you. Do you stand up? Yes. I am Briaz Nakshbandi from American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I introduced the first uh, Built Road Initiative course as a subject of discussion. And my question to you. Do you see any kind of, of delay in the implementation of the BRI as far as the United States is concerned, especially when we talk about the cybersecurity Silk Road? Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's a colleague at the back, please. There's a microphone just coming to you. Please. Thank you very much. My question actually goes to Professor Chan. Well, there is an adage that says that when two elephants fight, it's the, the grass that gets affected. So you raised many issues related to African countries, and you said that they are more of vulnerable. So how can African nations or in general developing countries can maintain their interests in this um, in this problem, in this trade war and other issues between the U.S. and uh, China. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Chan, a specific one to you on Africa and vulnerability. Then we're going to come back on BRI and on uh, technology and Russia. Well, I think that Africa is just starting uh, to make progress, and I'm actually very, very heartened by the appearance on the scene of the new Ethiopian. Uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who this year won the Nobel Peace Prize for ending the Ethiopian-Eritrean War, which has been going on for some decades. Uh, but what many people don't realize is that he's a very highly educated person. He is the first African leader with a PhD in computer science specializing in encryption. So this might make him into the world's most highly ranked spook, but it also makes him an incredibly wired up thinker what you've got, I think, is the emergence of a new generation which can drive forward development of a highly technocratic and electronic nature, which Africa has never had before. Uh, so if this kind of hopefully new trend can spread, what you can have is joined up government policy that prioritizes a modern order as we would understand it. 
And it's a modern order which I think that African people would also very greatly understand. I've seen wizened, illiterate farmers in the middle of nowhere on their cell phones dial up their agricultural credit. And this is a perfectly natural thing for them. It can transform just about everything. So I do hope that we are on the cusp of a new initiative. As for One Belt, One Road, generally, internationally, I think, yes, the United States has its own national interests at stake and will almost certainly seek to object to or jeopardize or hinder some aspects of One Belt, One Road, particularly when it comes to certain forms of electronic join up. Uh, the whole fight with Huawei, for instance, is only the start of a battle, I think, which is going to go on into many subsectors for quite some time to come. And in terms of One Belt, One Road, in terms of its naval iteration, uh, Chinese naval presence, Chinese uh, merchant fleets operating between China and uh, Africa to the edges of Europe, uh, a naval presence in the Horn of Africa. All of these things lead to great American alarm. So I think that what you can have is not just trade wars, but trade wars basically broaching into the possibility of armed confrontation. Thank you very much. Who else would like to come in on the BRI or on other comments that we've heard? Uh, Mabel and then Danny. Thank you. Mabel and then Danny. Okay. Regarding uh, building your initiative, uh, we know that uh, right now, most of the BRI project based on the bilateral relationship between China and other countries. I think the, this made a lot of misunderstanding. And so I think in the future, China will make it more multilateralized and make the rules more transparent and clear. Then we can make the, our foreign friends more uh, acceptable, uh, make it more acceptable to foreign friends. Uh, we know that uh, AIIB is initiated by China as well, which is a very successful example. China initiated a kind of international cooperation mechanism. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, I believe there is a uh, uh, new phenomenon is that the global governance is lagging behind the global practice. Um, so BRI is a kind of a global practice, and we should make it to be a, a kind of international mechanism. And uh, by the way, I would like to end one point uh, on this panel, is that uh, like the, um, the Dean mentioned that uh, multilateralism is very, very important to the small and the medium-sized states. Uh, we should maintain it, we should uh, protect it and uh, develop it. Like there's an uh, example that uh, um, the argument between the uh, big, big guy, uh, the big uh, uh, trade power and the small trade power, uh, like the big guy and the small guy. Uh, for the big guy, uh, have have some con uh, have conflicts with the small guy. The big guy would like the small guy would like invite the big guy to the uh, occasion, a place with a lot of people, so everybody can come on it. But uh, the big uh, big guy would like push the small guy to the small little corner and uh, beat him up. So this is the very important importance of the multilateralism. So I just uh, want okay. To thank thank you. you very much, Danny. Yeah, thank you. On the question about. The U.S., China, Russia getting together to to create a, a, a new world order. I think that would be uh, high on the wish list for many who want to see greater stability in the world, greater coming together in the world. I think right now, however, you know, being maybe a bit more realistic than aspirational about it, it, it seems unlikely. There's a dismal failure of trust all around the world. Uh, you know. Russia and China were the two targets that the U.S. security establishment had in mind when they said geostrategic rivalry is now the number one priority on our to-do list. It is also something that shows up again when America uses a rhetoric of how Russia and China are revisionist powers seeking to undermine the international system to reshape it for their authoritarian purposes. The language that I use is not mine. It comes from you know, security documents. It's a kind of language that's beginning to seep into popular American discussion, including publications like the New Yorker magazine, the Atlantic Monthly. It's a dismal time for trust in the world. That dismal time for trust 
shades over into what ought to be a straightforward economic proposition. The world, the developing world, needs infrastructure. Huge rates of return on investment in infrastructure that the Asia Development Bank uh, itself, long before China got into the AIIB or BRI space, was already announcing. Uh, right now, China has decided, has, has, has made the Belt Road Initiative an extension of Xi Jinping's power and authority. It is not something that sits very well and is inconsistent with the idea that this is a win-win possibility. Something needs to change in that narrative. And leaving that gap, leaving that trust deficit open means that all other kinds of narrative have rushed in to fill that space. Uh, America and the West has decided to label the Belt Road Initiative debt trap diplomacy. The idea being that it entraps uh, poorer nations into a, 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 a power-driven economic relationship with China. That's not very helpful either. Uh, to date, you know, and, uh, having said all this, the West has some legitimate grounds for suspicion on BRI projects. The West insists on high levels of procurement standards, environmental protection, labor standards, and not everyone might agree with those, but those are there in black and white. The AIIB, as Mabel says, another China-driven project, has to date not financed a single BRI project. So that speaks to how BRI itself needs to up the, its game on its procurement standards. But the bottom line is, unless we can repair this trust deficit in the world, we're in for a rocky ride, and my own money is with middle powers and small states stepping up to try and repair this deficit. Thank you very much, Danny. We're coming almost to the end of this panel. I'd just like, uh, in the last remaining minutes, uh, for all of my panelists to just reflect on one thing they've heard today that they think is something that uh, is a call to action. We've started, Danny, you've set out for us this rather dismal position of the lack of trust the lack of confidence, uh, the challenge for developmental peace in the context of these strains. What is the one thing that you think uh, needs to be on the agenda quickly to preserve uh, the rules-based order for the future, bearing in mind these challenges? And the same question to all my panelists. Danny. I think, I think uh, my own takeaway is the goodwill that you know, what we used to think of as the non-aligned movement, but basically the 80% the of the world not in, uh, the greatest crucible of, of great power competition, the goodwill that all the rest of us show, and the understanding that we have that the multilateral, multilateralism that's derived from the rules-based order is something that is so valuable, we cannot entrust it to just one nation who might malign it in all other kinds of ways. Okay. So we need to grab control of that. Thank you. So, Mabel, we heard that you can't, it's too important to entrust it to one nation, or indeed perhaps to two. What's your big takeaway from the discussion we've had today about the rules-based system? Mm, I still believe the multilateralism is very important, uh, especially for the small and medium-sized states. And uh, mm, finally, I would like to emphasize that US and China uh, regarding US-China relation, China and the US should avoid Thucydides' trap instead of jumping into it. So this is my key point. And uh, mm, for the international system, rules-based international system, the international community has to work together to protect and uh, develop the existing international institutions. That is the linkage of uh, our global governance, such as WTO. We also can uh, protect and innovate the RCEP or CPTPP, those brand new regional trading system um, based, rules-based international system. Okay. So has, uh, that, that saying that uh, TPP is going global. Um, enlarge it and China, US can join it. Okay, thank you very much. Jim, your last thought on the conversation we've had. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I like Danny's point about uh, small and medium powers exerting themselves in ways that can be creative. I think the, the TPP is a perfect example, right? The TPP was born out of the P4, all small states. And I think, you know, when it comes to the WTO, look, the president has said maybe we'll leave the WTO. There's no way he can do that. It would take Congress. There's, there's bipartisan support for remaining in the WTO. 
you know, for him, it's about the tactics of negotiation. Right. And what he does is he throws a grenade in the room and he thinks that that's going to prompt a negotiation. Um, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to, you know, the, the um, appeals, um, you know, uh, tribunal, it, it's going to take uh, smaller states to, because they're non-threatening, yeah, non right, to come up with creative proposals and try to build momentum where, you know, you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're outside of it. And that's, you know, essentially what you did with, with TPP. Um, and look, we'll, we'll, we will return to, um, you know, an administration at some point that might not differ tremendously strategically from where the Trump administration is, but tactically, I think, would take a different approach and one that might, um, you know, evolve a, a more, uh, you know, a more of a multilateral approach to trying to fix uh, some of the problems in the, in the international system. Very good. Thank you very much, Jim. Emma, your last thought. I believe that China can really play a, a very useful role in committing to support peace agreements if they can be reached in Syria and in Yemen by saying it will come in and it will put in the investment, it will help rebuild those societies and give those people who have suffered so much over the last few years some hope for the future, some potential to get their countries back and running and bring stability to the region. Thank you very much. Stephen. Well, for a rules-based order, then I'm very much in support of Mabel and uh, Jim in terms of trying to strengthen the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is absolutely critical here. And observing the proper procedures, proper rules within the WTO has to be the pathway to the future. I was also quite struck by a comment uh, of Danny's that once upon a time we looked to organizations like the Non-Aligned Movement as a grouping of countries in between the great powers who were learning to speak and stand up for themselves. But it's very, very interesting. We're all here at the Doha Forum. In a very, very curious way, and it is a curious way, the Doha Forum is the grown-up brother of the Non-Aligned Movement, but with a bit of economic muscle. Uh, its members are middle power states that are richer than the bulk of the states in the old non-aligned movement. This is the descendant of precisely that kind of possibility of cooperation, starting with dialogue, but possibly also leading to more substantive forms of cooperation in the future. Very good, Stephen. That seems like a very fitting end. We've had a conversation about small and medium-sized states, but we've really had a conversation about multipolar governance. Very good. Please join me in thanking my panel, and thank you to the audience for your questions. Thank you very, very much.